Awesome. Well, mate, I've got to say congratulations on Funny Pains and congratulations on getting it onto Tubi as well. Yeah, that was a, that was a long road all together around five years in the yeah. process. Um, it's pretty hard to get distribution nowadays and uh, to get an audience, so I'm really, really happy about it, so thank you. Yeah, we'll talk to you a little bit about the distribution in a moment, but I was wondering if for our listeners out there that haven't had a chance to see the film, tell us a little bit about the film and where the idea came about for you in the first place to actually put this documentary together. Sure. Well, um, I've always, I'm a filmmaker, I've been doing it for 14 years, but uh, always worked in fiction, screenwriting and all that stuff, and I always wanted to do a documentary. But no, no subject really, you know, got me going and, and actually got me on my chair and excited about it um, for me to pursue. So I was living in New York City. I love stand-up comedy, and I went to a, a stand-up show, as I usually do. And uh, I saw this woman get on the stage and work out this material that was so uh, raw and, and, and in your face and very, very personal. And she killed the crowd. So afterwards, I went to talk to her, and that's where I met uh, Wendy Starling, the subject of the documentary, uh, the protagonist, quote unquote. Um, and I decided to follow her, and I did for a couple of years. Um, and uh, I wanted to know more about stand up. I wanted to know what it meant to be a woman comic, especially in New York City. And also, um, just how interesting she was. She's a very layered person with a lot of, a lot of everything. She's, uh, you know, she lives with bipolar disorder but doesn't take medication. Uh, she's a rape survivor. Um, she has a very complex past, but she masterfully takes that darkness and turns it into comedy. And um, yeah, that's basically about, that's the story. And I also I shot with her for a couple of years, and then I got some famous comics from here from the U.S. Uh, just to chime in. So we go back and forth from Wendy's journey to more experienced and established comics, talking about the process because they went through it in their own way as well. Yeah. The, the personal lives of comedians here in Australia, it was something that was never touched on. I think everybody just thought they're the clown, they're there for pe- to make people laugh. It really hit home here in Australia when one of our leading stand-up comedians tried to take their own lives uh, tragically a few years ago. Do you think events like that and also the death of Robin Williams kind of made the audience aware of how dark lives can be quite often for these people that we do see as the modern-day clown? Oh, 100%. I think so. And, um, you know, you touched on something really important there is that you know, the stand-up comic, when he hits the stage, that's a persona. That's that person performing. That person doesn't go home and, and, and tell jokes to his kids or his roommates. He's usually working, sitting down, pretty quiet, writing down, working out material. And there's a lot that comes behind that, uh, making people laugh. I think comedians have this sensibility and this um, just different approach to understanding and feeling sadness and, and darkness, the darkness of life. And they know it so well that they dedicate their lives to take us away from that, um, at least for a couple of minutes, half an hour, an hour, when they do their show. So I think they're drawn to comedy to keep us away from that darkness uh, that they know pretty well. Yeah. The comedians that you feature in this documentary... How did they receive it when you first went to them and said, this is the idea for Funny Pains? Were were they hesitant or were they kind of excited about getting to tell their story? Well, usually comedians, they're a breed of their own. It's hard to get them on board and stuff. Uh, they can be very um, distracted and, um, and not follow up. Because their life usually is just going to bed very late, waking up very late as well, and doing it over and over again and being on the road. So getting them to sit down um, to shoot the, the those round tables, it took me like 11 months to get the, to actually get them in the same room. 
and shoot with them. And I only had with them like maybe two hours, maybe less. Yeah. They were so busy and the schedules all over the place. But we finally did it. They were they they. They actually were very interested, all of them, because I did this kind of like a teaser promo kind of sizzle kind of thing video that I made specially for them with what I had shot and what I wanted uh, what I wanted from them. So that got them really excited. Also, one of the executive producers uh, is also a comedian, and Christina Hutchinson. She's in the film, and she knew most of them, so it was kind of uh, easier to get through to them and reach out to them. Uh, you know, we had we had no money. We had little, little money, and they were really cool about it. They charged me basically nothing, and uh, they all they all worked terrific. It was great to meet them. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, how how tough is it to be a comedian in New York? Like, is it a an industry there where it's there's a rivalry? How difficult is it to be a comedian in New York? Well, the rivalry is always there, but I think that's the least of the issues, like what makes it hard. Imagine this city, you, you're going to have all these little clubs, all these little restaurants, all these little places that have shows every single night. And you can come in and have a room full of New Yorkers, or you can come in and have a, full, uh, a room full of Europeans. They don't get the jokes, they don't get the jokes about the subway the train they don't get about they don't get a lot of reference because they're american references yeah also they, uh, it was for me it was very shocking to learn you know i remember trying to find out how much they got paid and everyone's very secretive of that uh but finally they started opening up to me a couple of months in when i was shooting and like the headliner was getting 100 bucks uh the rest were getting 20 bucks and maybe a drink at the bar, and that yeah. was it. And I was like, how are you guys making it? You know, they all have day jobs. So they go to bed at 3, 4 in the morning, they wake up at 6, 7 in the morning, go to a day job, you know, delivery mail at an office, whatever, making juice, coffee, whatever, and then at night they do it over again. Yeah. And it's really, really hard because New York crowds are really tough. They're jaded, they're tired, they, they don't have a lot of money, so... You're not going to cut it with some more observational humor or whatever. It needs to be strong stuff like, like Wendy yeah. uh, generates. How do you think the um, the pandemic has affected the, the comedy circle there in New York as well? Because I know here our comedy clubs have been closed for 12 months. Um, the major comedy festivals here in Australia were all cancelled. How do you think the pandemic is going to have an effect on the comedy circle there in New York? Well, New York and everywhere, because right now, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, just all these great places that we have here that have been around for decades and decades are closed. A lot of places that were around for 30, 40 years closed forever, permanently, and um, it's been really rough. But we've had some comics, like like Andrew Schultz. He's the first one that comes to mind. He's in the documentary. He's killing it here. He's doing everything internet based. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have he doesn't have any any ties to corporate world or anything. And he took advantage of the pandemic and just reinvented how you do comedy uh, on podcasts and YouTube and all that stuff. Other comics have capitalized on that, but a lot have not done anything. Yeah. They haven't hit the stage because there's not. So I think a lot of more comedy clubs are going to close. But at the same time, a lot of comics are, have made good money. You know, the Joe Rogans and all, the, all those guys. He's opening up a new club in Austin, Texas. And I know some are going to follow his steps. And just, I think the comics are going to take over the comedy clubs. You know, you won't have to deal with a shady booker or, or anything like that. It's going to be, you know, a conversation from comic to comic. I think that's going to happen. Well, Jimmy Kimmel opened up in Las Vegas as well. So I think that's going to become a trend because a lot of places are closing that. Yeah, uh, a lot of people that were trying comedy just quit. Also, yeah. so yeah, I, I don't know how that's gonna affect the overall, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned before about the distribution of Funny Pains. Tell us a little bit about the struggle there for you. How difficult it's been, and how an outlet like Tubi is such a big help to filmmakers these days. Well, at the beginning, you know. 
when you finish a film, when you finish shooting and editing, you think you, you're you done. And that's when the work begins, because who's going to watch it? So if you don't have representation uh, to deal with a distribution company, you're going to have some issues, because they're going to offer you a deadbeat contract. Uh, they're going to be late on payments. That's a pretty nasty um, job and, 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 and medium. So thankfully enough, I in a film festival, I met a... I met this man called Princeton Holt, and he was the head of uh, acquisitions at Hughes Pictures in New York City. We started talking, hit it off, you know, exchanged cards, and he told me to send them anything that I have from the documentary. I sent them a couple of clips, and he just loved it. He was like, I want to, you know, I want to represent you guys, which was a huge surprise to me. They would have been of great help and support to us, and once the movie was done, he went out and it took him a couple of months to get the, uh, the best deal possible. The toughest part was that when we started shooting this five years ago till now, distribution has changed 100%. You know, movie theaters don't matter anymore. Netflix, you know, started buying everything. But then Disney Plus came in and just there's this battle. And now you can be on any streamer and make zero dollars. Yeah, if that's what you want, if you want people to watch it, but thankfully they did a good job and they they you know we landed a good distribution deal with Passion River uh, Films and you know Tubi is huge because Tubi takes us back to when we used to watch more movies on TV that you had a couple of breaks um, on Tubi you're gonna have three breaks of like 15 20 seconds uh, an ad and then the movie keeps going you don't even have to sign in. You don't have to give your information if you don't want to. There's no, there's no friction. You don't have to spend any money. Yeah. So Tubi has has grown in 2020 a lot, and I think it's going to grow even more because it's absolutely free. Definitely. Well, I know a lot of people are going to check out Funny Pains on Tubi. So, is there anything you would like to say to those people out there that are about to sit down and listen and watch Funny Pains? Well, if you want to learn more, just go to Funny Pains. Dot com. This is a movie made with a lot of heart, a lot of love. Um, I directed, produced, and edited, so this is my baby, uh, and I'm I'm very proud of it. And I hope you all enjoy it. Definitely. Well, Joji, thank you so much for chatting to us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. And again, hopefully, we get to chat again in the future. Yes, sir. Thank you, David. Have a wonderful day. You too, mate. Stay safe, and we'll talk soon. Likewise. Bye.